Come on in, and if we can take our seats. Welcome. Thank you so much for choosing to be here on this Sunday afternoon to honor the memory of a great, great man, an incredible human being. And those of you who are here knew him, and so you know that I won't exaggerate in anything that I say uh, about Harold Shapiro, uh, and that I can't begin to do justice uh, to the amazing neshama, the amazing soul uh, that we memorialize today. I'm going to read the words of Margaret Tory. The intention. Healing is both an exercise and an understanding, and yet not of the will nor of the intention. It is a wisdom and a deeper knowledge of the daily swing of life and death in all creation. There is defeat to overcome and acceptance of living to be established and always there must be hope. Not hope of healing, but the hope which informs the coming moment and gives it reason. The hope which is each person's breath, the certainty of love and of loving. Death may live in the living and healing rise in the dying, for whom the natural end is part of the gathering and of the harvest to be expected. To know healing is to know that all life is one and there is no beginning and no end. And the intention is loving. We are, we are here to remember a man who was all about loving. We're here to honor a giant in the world in terms of hope. No one understood hope better than our beloved Harold. And a person who knew about healing as well, dedicated to healing, but also who personally struggled through whatever he had to and held it with such dignity and such grace, whatever his own struggles, um, he always put them aside in order to get the work done. The work that would exhaust most of us, he took on no matter what kind of discomfort or personal challenges he was facing. He was simply a giant. And Cantor Frankel uh, is going to offer the words Sim Shalom, asking that we be granted peace. That is what he wanted. It's what he worked for. He didn't just hope for it. He worked for it. He made it happen in little increments. Hope where most people would throw up their hands. And uh, we are very grateful for that. Sim Shalom, Tova Uvracha, grant peace, goodness, and blessing. Adonai, Elohim, 
תורת חיים ואהבת חסד מוצדקה וברכה ורחמים וחיים ושלום וטוב בעיניך את עמך ישראל וכל אלה וכל שב ישלומך ברוך אתה אדוני המברך את עמו So if you knew Harold, you knew how much he adored his grandson, David, and what an incredibly special relationship they had, and in David's case, still have, uh, because <laughs> Harold will always uh, be in David's life, will always be uh, a relationship that is critically important to David. Uh, David is doing wonderful things in Barcelona, yeah, in Barcelona, uh, and um, we are very proud of him uh, and for his parents letting him go that far away. Um, but of course, he loved Harold so much that he wanted to send uh, words that he wanted me to read. Rabbi Amy, Stephen, Cantor Chaim, and each of you there at Keilat Israel, thank you all for coming to celebrate the life of my grandfather, Harold Shapiro who passed away on February 28th in Manhattan at the age of 89. I have asked Rabbi Amy to share this message with all of you due to the fact that I am studying abroad at the Universitat Autonoma Barcelona in Barcelona, Spain for a semester and cannot be there in person. Instead, I am happy KI has a camera <laughs> so I can watch it live on my computer. Words of wisdom do not express how blessed I am to have had the most extraordinary, loving, dedicated, and intelligent grandpa in my life for 19 years. He gave me so many unforgettable, generous gifts that will last a lifetime. I am very proud and lucky to share with you some wonderful memories I had with the great Harold Shapiro. They are bullet points. going on family vacations all over the world, understanding and having patience for my autism, celebrating Jewish holidays, my bar mitzvah, and reciting the Aliyah before I would chant from the Torah on high holidays, teaching me the religion of Judaism, teaching me how to bear hug, tikkun olam, giving generously to many places, including my sleepaway camp, Camp JRF, and to KI, celebrating my accomplishments in education, playing games, seeing movies and shows, watching me grow up, enjoying my extracurricular activities such as bowling, playing basketball and the piano, as well as my theater performances. Most importantly, seeing me adapt to being successful in life. He was proud of me. It is very sad for me to say that we have lost a man who loved life and lived it to the fullest. We will certainly remember him and love him in our hearts forever. Best wishes to our congregation, and I wish each and every one of you an amazing time and a Shana Tova, a happy new year. With love and admiration, David Sharif.
some of my one of my favorite memories of David is when we were at the bowlathon because he's an incredible bowler and I feel like he was teaching me philosophy when um, after we'd been playing for a while um, and he was on my team because uh, it was the KI team and so he came over to me he said put his hand on my back he said you know Rabbi if you throw it straight down the center it knocks down all the pins. <laughs> I carry that with me as, as a teaching from David about more than just bowling, I have a feeling. <laughs> so I'm now going to ask Karen to come share some thoughts. Wow, thank you all for being here today. It's great to look out and see so many friends from LA, from the KI community. It's so very special celebrating, celebrating Dad today with each of you. And to do it here at KI makes it all the more special. I also want to say hi to all our friends and family. Hi David and others who I know are watching through the camera. Kehillat Israel is a very special place, a community for me. I have many wonderful memories of sharing this congregation with my dad, including both our son's births and their bar mitzvahs and high holidays. In picking today to celebrate this date, to, to celebrate dad, it seemed perfect because this was the time of year he would always come to L.A. and visit us, and it, it's a special time, the high holidays. And I know many of you have told me today they remember him at high holiday services and remember uh, him sitting in the front row with us and being a family together, and it's just a very special memory that I will always cherish and always have and always think about these high holidays. And it started when I was a little girl, actually, in Dalton, Georgia. Enjoying high holidays with Dad was always a special time for me. He would take off from work, which he didn't do very often, and he and I would go earlier than my mom and sister. And I would dress up, and I would take my little purse <laughs> and go with him and sit next to him. And it, I would... We would sing together, and, we, and it just was a special bonding time for me with him. I left home when I was 15 years old, and after that, for almost 20 years, or maybe even more, I, we never celebrated high holidays together. I le and that was until I joined KI, and I married Sayud. And I had my son, Ben. And then I invited them, my mom and dad, to come and celebrate the holidays with us. I think at first it was the grandson that enticed them more. But soon they started making it every year. They loved hearing Chaim's electrifying voice. Singing. They loved listening to your sermons before you were here. <laughs> they also enjoyed you, Dee Dee, and hearing your voice. And they, it was a special time, and it, it, it was irresistible. And K.I. brought one of my favorite things back to me, which was celebrating high holidays with my dad and bonding again. So I'm forever grateful for that. David was, David, hi David. <laughs> Dad was so taken by the incredible music that he got, he got time to record the High Holiday and Shop Up music on three different CDs that were dedicated to his parents, which we all listen to and enjoy now and are grateful for. What an amazing gift 
And then I would sit in on fascinating conversations that he would have with Stephen about Israel. They would talk at length, discuss, never really argue, but discuss. They, they really had similar views. They just didn't always share it in the same way. But it was really wonderful to be able to sit in on those conversations. And then it got me involved. And now, of course, I was able to share in my, the organization that my dad founded, Partners for Progressive Israel. And that led me to that. And so I'm, again, we come back to chaotic. So, and then Amy, one of my favorite memories with you, was when dad invited you and Judy to the Theater Bacal concert that Amy produced in uh, honor of Theo's 90th birthday. And we all went together and had the most fun time together. I still think about that night often. My dad was very connected to KI. It was his Jewish home, even though he lived in New York. He always felt this was his home. He and mom would come here. They contributed. I'm most grateful that I can go sit on a bench up there and see his name. And my kids can see it and, and be proud that their grandparents contributed. So I thank Joe Stern for introducing me to KI in the first place. And I thank you, Sayud, for sharing this community with me and with our sons. And then I thank all of you here in LA for always welcoming dad when he would come and to the KI community with your most amazing open arms. You brought the bonding that a little girl had with her dad to the next level. As it is not the beautiful building which we all adore, but it's the community, it's the people that really make the difference. My dad was the ultimate optimist, and I wonder often what he would think or say. But what I, I know how he would feel today, and I can picture him smiling. I am filled with love and forever grateful. So thank you all. One of the centerpieces of those services that Harold loved so much. Um, it'll be very hard to look in the front row this year. Very hard. But one of the pieces is Lador Vador from generation to generation. So very, very fitting. And you talking about him sharing it with you uh, and then you all sharing it later and uh, bringing children uh, into this congregation, but um, also Harold represented what it means to pass the best to the next generation. He did it by example. And when we have teachers who live what they teach, that is an incredible blessing. Uh, and certainly he's given that to many, many people in the younger generations, many of us. Lador Vador. You could join me, many of you know it. Lador Vador, Lador Vador, Lador Vador, Agigor Lecha, Ulenetzachnetzachin, Ulenetzachnetzachin. Kedushat Chana Kedish Ledor Vador Ledor Vador Ledor Vador Nagi Gorecha Ulenei Tzach Netzachim Ulenei Tzach Netzachim Thank 
Gary Spire will now come share a few words. Looks good, huh? Yes, it is. That mic looks good on me. Well, uh, so I want to thank the family for uh, asking me to say a couple of words about Harold. Um, I have a kind of different point of view because I'm sort of a newbie to Harold. I calculated that I've only known Harold for about the last fifth of his life. But I'm figuring if a fifth of scotch is enough to show the essence of something, then a fifth of a life ought to be revealing pretty much in the same way. So, as far as I could see, Harold had a great last fifth. <laughs> We've already heard and are going to hear some more about Harold's background from a kind of interior point of view. So I'd like to talk about Harold from an exterior point of view as a kind of builder. Harold the builder is my concept. And this was inspired by him, because I met him only after he'd already grown up uh, as a member of what we have now come to recognize as the demographic of the greatest generation. And we're finding, as we move on, there's probably a reason for that appellation. And after he already built a marriage with Myra, and built a family with Karen and Judith and his grandchildren and had already, of greater interest to me, uh, built and sold a substantial business, which if you've ever had that experience, you probably remember it takes a little while to do that. And you've got to assume that Harold drew great empowerment from these previous building projects that he engaged in because I only met him after he decided to embark on another one of his building projects, and this one was a real doozy. <laughs> Even to me, I was impressed. He decided to build peace in the Middle East, <laughs> and he did that through the creation of the organization we now know as Partners for Progressive Israel. And in so doing, he introduced me to a series of really remarkable independent thinking people like Stephen and Sandy and a number of other people who served in and out of his board. And in connection with the organization, he sat me down one day and told me I had to go with him with a small group of these peace builders to the Middle East on one of his annual seminars there. He was very careful in my case not to say it's a trip to Israel. <laughs> because he and I spent a lot of time talking about the risks and benefits of being in a multicultural marriage. 
which Karen brought to him as an issue in his life, and he had to learn to navigate that. And I don't know why he was talking to me about it. <laughs> but we had some conversations about the impacts of that kind of commitment, and I had a, a, a special appreciation for his perspective on it as a son of a rabbi who had to go through a great personal transformation to integrate that information into his day-to-day -day life. The trip he proposed was going to be throughout the Middle East. That's how he pitched it to me. And I said, what the hell, I've never been there. Let's do it. So the trip, this particular trip took place about a decade ago. And it was in the midst of one of the many contentious periods that region has gone through. It was not a peaceful time to be there. We went to the West Bank. We went to Israel proper. And of most interest to me, and I think of some interest to Harold during that particular historic paragraph, we went to Egypt. Now, in all of these places, we watched Harold as a group. We watched him wrestle with friends and foes of peace on every side, in every location, around the complex issues of what might be required of these people and what each of them might be called upon to sacrifice in the event peace were to emerge in the region. I think for all of us, the trip turned, with Harold turned out to be more illuminating than any of us expected. We met with ambassadors, diplomats, generals, politicians, journalists, teachers, members of the intelligentsia, and members of a community which, growing up in a democracy, I had never spent five minutes even thinking about because we take so much for granted here growing up in the U.S., but we spent a lot of time in the community of civil society. It's not even something we recognize in America. It's so integrated into our cultural opportunities here. But in a place like Egypt, which at the time was struggling with the tenets of democracy, civil society, which are the associations of people of common interests and common professions and common jobs, uh, these, were rare, these were rare birds in a society like Egypt. <laughs> um, as a result of all these contexts, however, Harold was always the same guy. He was always leading, listening, posing really pointed questions, and generally cajoling every party he met, he met towards momentum always building on momentum wherever we went. I have this one photo in my office of Harold being surrounded by uh, busloads of Egyptian school children at the pyramids of Giza one afternoon. And Harold, in his obviously Ashkenazic splendor, was a kind of exotic fruit for these local school kids. It's sort of hard to explain, but he looked different than they did, as, we, as all of us did. But what I noticed that day was that he treated these groups of kids the same way he addressed the diplomats and the generals and the ambassadors, with respect, with friendship, and with hope. Through that process and through Harold's actions and commitments, I think Harold taught all of us who were with him and anyone paying any attention at all about the deep differences that can exist in the different conceptions of what peace is. There is the convenient kind of peace that, oh, that everyone is always in favor of so long as nothing in their life gets sacrificed or changed. I think Harold was not that interested in that kind of peace. Then there's the convenient kind of peace uh, that is forced through the projection of the force of arms and imposed on people, 
which of course is not really so much a really a peace as it is a kind of standoff. And I don't think Harold was really particularly interested in that kind of peace either. I think the kind of peace he was interested in building was the kind that grows from the illumination of the hearts and minds of the populations on every side of a complex multilateral conflict. And that, of course, is the kind of an abiding, permanent kind of peace that I think he was envisioning. I think Harold understood in this last fifth that this process, this kind of illumination, would require a, such a fundamental change in attitude that it was really a multi-generational endeavor. I think that's what I saw when he was communicating with the school children. I think he saw it was, this kind of effort was going to take beyond our lifetimes to achieve. The last time I saw Harold, he gave me this really cool flashlight. It has his name on it. And I said, hey, thanks, that's great. <laughs> but why a flashlight? And after a pause, which I recognized was his technique to assess the measure of the person he was talking to, <laughs> he said, you know, sometimes you just find yourself in the dark. <laughs> and it's nice to have a little light. Well, Harold, wherever you are, since you're gone, I think our world has become a little bit darker. So thanks for the illumination. Our Rabbi Emeritus, Rabbi Stephen Carr Rubin. I love this picture because I feel like I'm like all of us who were privileged to have Harold give us this peace dove. He gave me two, so Didi's wearing one as well. The first one was simply because I said, oh, I love that. So he took it off and gave it to me. <clears throat> And the second one was because I said, I still love that, and he gave me another one. <laughs> I, guess, um, I guess my first real encounter with Harold was um, around Karen and Sayud's wedding, which was quite a while ago, 27 years, but who's counting? Uh, you were my first Jewish Muslim wedding. Not, not my only, but my first <laughs> Jewish Muslim wedding. And um, so that was exciting enough for me just because it was a privilege to be able to do that. And, um, and also just to know both of you and, and both of your incredible families. It was like the United Nations showing up in Brooklyn uh, in the Botanical Garden that day it was incredible. But then there was Harold. Harold who, um, who embraced the world in a way that most people couldn't possibly. And your wedding was like a microcosm of that for me. It was such a perfect symbol of who he is who he was, who he continues to be, the, the role model that he continues to be forever for all of us who surely feel privileged to have been a part of his life and, and know him. The grace that he had, the incredible sweetness and grace that he had. Um, it, with everyone, as Gary was sharing, uh, children, adults, Diplomats, generals, it didn't matter. Rabbis, cantors, <laughs> and anyone else. Um, he encountered all of us, embraced all of us, hugged all of us, 
welcomed all of us into his sphere, into his life, and inspired all of us. I mean, to say that, that I thought of Harold as, as one of the rare times I totally got that traditional Jewish notion of Lamed Vavnikim, the 36 righteous that hold up the world, to say that it was so clear he was one of those sounds like a cliche, but it was profoundly true for me, the, the privilege of being in his presence. And it was year after year after year after year after year that I kept promising him, when I retire, I'll come on the symposium. <laughs> when I retire was the best excuse I had was I was way too busy, ask Amy, way too busy to possibly take the time to go on that. But when I retire, and then I realized I was retired. <laughs> so I went on the symposium, which was, as anyone who's some of us in the room have been, um, the Harold Shapiro experience is unlike anything else. It's just unlike anything else. And I've been to Israel a lot of times, and I lived there for two years, and nothing was like being there with Harold. Um, and that, too, was a perfect symbol of who he was and the breadth of his connections and the depth of his love for people. Um, Didi mentioned to me earlier, you know, when she thought about it, it was clear that Harold had three passions to which I agree. The three passions were family, Israel, and theater in that order. We loved that he loved the theater. We loved that he invested in the theater because we got the best seats every time we went to New York because Harold loved the theater. And we would call Harold, we're coming to New York. And, you know... When all of us have talked about high holidays, of course, because you know your trips annually out here for the high holidays, standing on the beam and looking down and seeing Harold and the family there was kind of like the theater. You know, he would always have primo seats <laughs> for the high holidays as well. And Harold was literally, we have like a thousand families, we have thousands of people that come in and out of uh, high holidays and things every year, but Harold was the only one every year <laughs> that insisted I print my high holiday sermons and hand them to him after the service so he could go home and read them. You know, I've given high holiday sermons for 40-something years now, but last year was my favorite. Last year was my favorite and will always be my favorite because last year was the year that... Uh, Didi and I had the privilege of being with Myra and Harold in New York, even in that hospital room space where I got to deliver my sermon all over again <laughs> just for the two of you, like there were a thousand people in the room. And it was my favorite high holiday moment of all time. Harold Shapiro was, he was a gift. And I am grateful for the gift. All of us are grateful for the gift. Thank you, Karen, because through you, I knew your parents and your sister and your family and, of course, the privilege of your sons. And thank you, Harold. This is one of several celebrations and there could be one a week all over the country, all over the world, because all of us have that, that sense of gratitude of having been touched by an angel. And that was Harold to me, being touched by an angel. And I know that his blessing of his life will continue, is continuing Lador Vador, as Cantor Frankel so beautifully sang, forever. You asked, and we have the privilege of sharing a, a song, so I'd like to ask Didi to come up and, because Harold was 
so grateful for who love music so much. And how many generations of rabbis came before him? 13, 14 generations of rabbis and then Harold. And, <laughs> and the last thing I'm going to say is I didn't know the other rabbis, but he was the best rabbi of all. <laughs> For you, Harold. Second row, first row, first seat. (sighs) Vishamru, Vine Israel, Vishamru at Hashaba. La sot et ha Shabbat. La sot et ha Shabbat. Le dorot amberit olam. Beini uve bine Yisrael. First of all, um, I'd like to thank all the family and friends that have gathered here today to honor Harold and those of uh, us, the family, that are watching uh, the live event. We greatly appreciate your love and friendship and thank you for being part of our lives. It's quite difficult for me to reflect on the numerous things that Harold accomplished over the long arc of his 89 years but I'll attempt to take a few nuggets out of his meaningful life here on the planet. Our relationship goes back almost 30 years when I approached Harold to get his blessing to marry Karen. I sent shockwaves through his life. (laughs) Here I was, a young man, born not only in a different faith, but in a different culture, and with a totally different background, asking him to marry his firstborn. On top of that, ours was a bi-coastal relationship. Karen was living here in California, and I was living in New York. Now, parents sitting here would understand the enormity of such a request. He was very polite, and he would ask some probing questions about our religious and cultural differences and how we would raise children if we were to have any. 
Now, let me add another twist to this story, which you've all heard. Harold's father was an Orthodox rabbi. So you can understand the, norm, uh, the, the difficulty that he had and how heart-wrenching it was for him to reconcile the fact that his daughter was going to marry me. Remember Kevya's predicament in Fiddler on the Roof? What about tradition? How was he going to share this news with his extended family? What were they going to think? What would the, he just did not want Karen to be hurt. Um, he would get upset with Karen, but he never expressed his frustrations with me. He was always polite, like a true Southern gentleman. Up until our wedding, he struggled with the idea of our marriage and sought counsel from friends. Finally, on the day of our wedding, he gave us his blessing, and he shared the dream he had in which his father, Rabbi Joseph, spoke to him, and I'm paraphrasing. Harold, times change, and you have to change your times. It was a heartfelt speech that drew, not only me, drew me not only closer to him, but showed the magnanimity of his heart. Over the course of the next 25 years, Harold, Myra, and Judith made it a point to come to Los Angeles for every special occasion, be it the birth, bris, or bar mitzvah of Benjamin and David. He loved it so much, as you've heard, he became an active member of KI. And some of this may sound redundant to you, but I'm going to repeat it. He was always there for every service, seated in the front row, listening to every word the clergy had to say. And as Stephen mentioned, he was the only congregant that I know who got a copy of Rabbi Stephen's sermon every time he delivered it. And as a matter of fact, Stephen got so used to it that he would bring an extra copy with him so that he could give it to Harold. And even to this day, all the sermons are neatly filed in his office. It gave him great pride and joy when he would go up to the Bema to hear Karen, Benjamin, or David chant from the Torah, to see the generations follow the tradition of high holidays. During the spring break, we would go back east to celebrate Passover. Karen and Harold had developed the family Haggadah, which was regularly updated every year to incorporate the events, that, the current events, and connect them with the Jewish traditions. I remember my very first Passover that I celebrated with Harold, Myra, Judith, and Karen in their family home in Chattanooga. Passovers with Harold were always lively and invariably involved politics especially what was happening in Israel. Harold, as you've all heard through repeated um, people talking about it, was a staunch supporter of the state of Israel. And not only did he support the cause of a strong and democratic Israel with monetary support, he devoted the last 30 years of his life in helping build a country which would stand for the civil rights of all the people in Israel, including Arabs and Jews, women and children. He funded a school where Jewish and Arab children could attend the school side by side. To further the cause of a peaceful and strong Israel, he would go to Israel every year and lead numerous educational trips, meeting with Israeli prime ministers, foreign ministers, members of the Knesset, Chairman Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, King Hussein, you name it pleading with them to further the peaceful settlement of the Israeli-Arab conflict. Like many U.S. presidents, he was not always successful in achieving his goal completely, but until his dying days, he was involved and engaged with the Partners for Progressive Israel. Now that is a true dedication to a cause. 
Another cherished memory I have of our family Passovers with Harold was the matzah bride that he would wear the next day. Now, Harold did not eat bread for the whole week, so he would improvise and make matzah toast with cheese or even matzah French toast that we loved. In October of 1994, Harold and Myra took a trip to Pakistan visiting Islamabad and Karachi to meet my mother and other siblings who could not attend our wedding. It was a long and arduous trip because right after visiting Pakistan, they flew to Syria, Jordan, and Israel. Now, most of you know that all these countries are at loggerheads with each other, so it made the trip a lot more challenging. However, for them to make the effort to visit my family meant a lot not only to me personally, but to my entire family. And over the course of the last 27 years of our marriage, that bond of love has solidified. Family and love of family were always dear to Harold. He made it a point as the elder in the family to organize family reunions so that all the extended family could stay connected, attending every bar and bar mitzvah, wedding, and other important family occasion. His benevolence and generosity touched many members of the extended family, his nieces and nephews and their children. He always made sure that ne their needs were taken care of both emotionally and financially. One of my endearing memories of Harold is when we would get together for family vacations. We would play family games like Scrabble, Bago, Apples to Apples, or Pictionary. He may be tired, but he always joined in. We would all burst out laughing hysterically when he would give an explanation for a goofy word or a picture that he had drawn. When Benjamin and David were old enough to go to college, it was my selfish wish that they would choose a university here on the West Coast. Alas, that wish never came true. <laughs> they both ended up choosing universities on the East Coast, NYU and Pace University. In hindsight, I'm happy that they ended up being in New York because they were able to spend some quality time with Harold, especially Benjamin. When Benjamin turned 21 and was old enough to be in a casino, Harold, his friend Norman, and Benjamin would often go to Atlantic City during the week to gamble, eat, drink, and have a good time. <laughs> now, in all the years that I've known Harold, I cannot recall him using a foul word. But when Benjamin would call us, he'd say, Grandpa is a different man when he's in Atlantic City. <laughs> he, he even used the F word. <laughs> so, a lot of people uh, did not know that Harold was an army veteran. He was posted in Japan during the Korean War. Two years ago, on our last international trip with him, we visited Paris and Norman, Omaha Beach in Normandy. <coughs> it's a breathtaking sight to see all the gravestones and imagine the devastation and destruction of war. While we were there, a special ceremony was held for veterans who were in the group that day. It was truly a special moment in our lives to see Harold up there with all the veterans in the semicircular colonnade as taps were played followed by the Star Spangled Banner. More importantly, I was thrilled for Benjamin and David to see their grandpa being honored. Last year, in February, my father passed away. It's ironic, <laughs> excuse me, it's ironic that I lost both Harold and my father in the month of February, almost exactly a year apart. Daddy died on February the 3rd, and Harold passed away on the 28th. 
one of the most comforting calls I got was from Harold, who shared with me his emotions of how he felt when he lost his father. He shared with me that each individual's loss is very personal and no words can replace the person. To hear the soothing words from him helped alleviate my grief. I could go on and on and share more interesting stories with you, but I don't want to take up all your time. I would, however, like to conclude with a quote from the famous poet Maya Angelou, and I quote, I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Harold had an innate ability to make people feel good, and that's why he'll be remembered forever. Thank you. Well, when you talked about passion um, for his Harold that Harold had for his family, um, for what came before family? family? You had three. What was it? Uh, family, Israel, and Israel. Oh, yes, yes, Israel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and theater, right. Uh, our connection, which was um, oh, very, very long. I met Harold when I was a freshman at college. He was a senior. We were married for 64 years. Um, and uh, because I'm passionate about poetry, I think it is amazing listening to what Harold did, Harold's passions, Harold's goodness. I, I never thought about goodness. Harold was easy. That's what I always thought. All these different places, different ideas, different things he could embrace. Yes, it was difficult. He, <laughs> as, as Sayud said, difficult, difficult. But, but he was a remarkable now that I hear all this and think back about it. Um, and personally, I think remarkable the way that poetry came into his life. He, I would say, was passionate about poetry. He could listen. Not everyone can listen to poetry. And I would write, and he would be able to say, that's strong, or, ah, about a line. And I valued that, but of course took it for granted, in a way, the way we do. Um, so, what I want to do is to read a poem that reflects the first time that I met him and then span to 64 years later. Uh, this poem about our second date at the University of Texas is called Barton Springs. He could dance, he could croon, a senior, I, a freshman, he was the only man I knew who would listen to my stories. 
but I don't remember hearing his story those first nights together. He seemed to relish frat jokes, silly wildness, his knife against the seal of the bottle, laughing, calling it a circumcision. <laughs> but when I tore my finger on a tin, second date, a picnic, spreading blankets on the banks of Barton Springs, he bandaged my thumb, he cut my meat, he attended as no man ever had, to my childhood pouring out of me. Like a brother, I thought. And because I grew up in a family of women, sisters, my mother had sisters, it was an amazing thing to me, I think, when I say like a brother. And now when I think about it, the way that Harold was comfortable with women. He was just comfortable. And maybe that's David's <laughs> love of his bear hug. He, he had that, that way of being comfortable, as everyone has said, with people. But for me personally, it was that comfort with women. Not every man has. Or had, certainly, at that time. And uh, people who are sitting here now are part of our lives through poetry. Um, I, uh, I'm so glad you're here <laughs> because you know that part of Harold. And um, it goes through our time in New York, our time in Chattanooga, our time in New York, and somewhere uh, in that time, from the 80s on, to something that a poet, Robert Bly, began, which was the Conference of the Great Mother, and then it came to be called the Conference of the Great Mother and the New Father. And that's what it is. And there are people sitting here now that I know from that time. And that legacy we get to pass on to Ben, to Benjamin. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's remarkable to me to look up and see you. And uh, to be grateful to Robert Bly for beginning it and the fact that it carries on. Now, two more poems, not of mine. One is one that just popped up this morning when I was picking up the book, and I somehow had this in here. It's by Raymond Carver. And I think Harold's love for other people is reflected in it. What makes you able to love? It's called Late Fragment by Raymond Carver. And did you get what you wanted from this life, even so? I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. And the personal reflection of that was that in January of this year, I went to a conference I go to often, and Harold would go with me sometime, the Palm Beach Poetry Festival that takes place in Florida, near where my sister lives. And so I go, and then I get to visit with her. Harold would come. He'd met many of the poets who come to that conference, and uh, this year he was not able to go, and I said, Harold, should I leave? I don't know. It doesn't matter if I go or not. It's okay. I'll stay here. And Karen was there. He said, go. Of course go, and say hello to everyone. And I did, and I said, 
I'll call you during the week, of course, and I can always come back. So I did call. Uh, and about three days after I was there, he said, are you writing? Have you seen so-and-so? I said, yes. And he said, good. And just out of my mouth it came. Why don't you write a poem, I said. Four lines. Teacher that I am, write a poem. Four lines. He said, okay. Didn't even stop to think. Okay. So when I came home and we were having dinner, I said, Harold, did you write that poem? He said, yes. My handwriting, though, was shaky. I couldn't, so I asked Karen to write it down. And this is Harold's poem. As the days pass, so do the nights. And that is where we find the peace that we all look for. And that's what I've thought about since then. He never, he was not a complainer. He didn't complain about being ill, as ill as he was for a period of time. But he expressed in those few lines where his peace had come to be. And now I have it, now I know, and may it be, may it be, that he rest in peace. And thank you all for loving him. We are coming to the season for KI of Harold Shapiro. We're coming to that time of year where we could always look forward to a visit, and then he would always arrange a private meeting um, with the rabbis. Um, Harold indeed was comfortable with women, which was a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. He was gracious and respectful and kind and sought a private meeting with me, which I was very flattered to accept. I also loved Harold because he talked right. <laughs> <laughs> I miss hearing people talk right out here, <laughs> being from Atlanta. Um, it was always wonderful. Um, the cadence, even of your speech, Myra, um, Harold's gentle cadence always ready to engage, always curious about what you're thinking, always curious about your perspective, always curious on what you've read and what's your take on it, or how do you understand this idea that I'm understanding in a certain way. He was always curious and open, and he was easy. He was easy to be with. He was easy to know. He was easy to love. Easy has nothing to do with how hard he was, how strong he was. So easy to be around, but so strong. A man of such courage, such incredible bravery. All the ideas he had in this world about how we could get along and what we needed to do and be for and with each other, he was willing to take into his own personal life. He was ready to look at, all right, I say those things, do I mean it enough to bless my daughter's wedding? Do I mean it in the places where I'm challenged and I'm pushed? And he did. He was a man of great courage because he was willing to take his ideas and look at where he was stuck and be honest about that. He had the courage to face his own understandings of the world that needed to be changed, to bring more peace, to bring more ease and joy and love into this world. We're in desperate need right now of people like Harold Shapiro, Forgive me, it's that time of year when we rabbis are 
wrapped up in sermon writing. Every spare moment of the day, our sermons are creating themselves. Everything we see, everything we think, everything we hear is related to what is our message. And my message this Rosh Hashanah, I will dedicate to the memory of Harold Shapiro. And it will be about what we need to do in this country in Israel, in the world, to make it more reflective of the vision he had, what he thought was truly possible. And I hope that we will honor his memory this year, going forward into a new year, by being willing to do whatever it takes to look at where our ideals and what we say we believe in, where, where do we need to take them in to our own lives? Where are we ready to be pushed? and challenged to be better people. And what are we willing to do? Harold knew it was going to be generational, as we've heard, the solutions. But he was not going to hesitate for a minute to take the next step he could to making this project of a loving, peaceful world a reality. He was ready to take whatever next step he could. May we wrestle with our own cynicism, and our own fatigue, and our own busyness. And may we have the courage to hope, and the courage to love, and the courage to change, and do whatever small thing that's called from us right now to make this world one that Harold would be proud of. We'll close with Mourner's Kaddish, thanking the source of life, for the gift of Harold's life. We rise as a congregation to recite Kaddish. Kadal vid kadash shemeraba. Bea ma divra chirute viam lich malchute. The chayechon of yomechon uv chaye de chobe Israel. Bagala uvizman kariv viimru. Amen. Yehesh me rabba mevorach leolam o melmaya. Yit barach vish tabach vid poar vid ramam vid nase. Vit hadar vid alev vid talal shemay de kudsha brichu. Leela min kol birchata veshirata, tuj bechata venechemata, da ami ran belma vimru, amen. Yehe shlama raba min shemaya, bechayim alenu ve al kol Yisrael ve imru, amen. O se shalom birmamav, hu ya se shalom, alenu ve al kol Yisrael ve al kol yoshve tevel ve imru, amen. May the source of wholeness in this world work through each one of us in Harold's memory in such a way that we might contribute to a world that is more shalem, more whole, therefore one step closer to shalom, to peace. You may be seated. Uh, the family invites you after this service to join them for a little refreshment, a little spirit, and a little uh, refreshment where we can continue to share with them memories and stories, uh, keeping uh, for them, that connection through us to Harold. And uh, it is a very fitting way to end this service. Harold ran the party cabin at the conference. He was a partier. So that is our obligation to honor his memory by having a little party on the patio. And next time you feel at all inclined, invite a bunch of folks over and just have a party because Harold would love that. Harold would love that. So very fitting, uh, the song uh, that he and Karen danced to at Karen's wedding, but so expressive of uh, Harold's whole uh, way of being in the world. Imagine by John Lennon. Join us. Please, that's on the back of your program. Sing with us. You all know it. Let's sing it. Let's be one chorus, one voice for Harold. Let's all rise. Let's all stand since we'll exit right after. Let the blood flow from head to toe. 
Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us on the sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Aha! Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion to Although I wouldn't have a job <laughs> Imagine all the people Living a life in peace You, you, you may, may say I'm a dreamer But, but I'm not, not the only one I hope someday you'll join us And the world will be as one Imagine no possessions I wonder if you can No need for greed or hunger a brotherhood of man Imagine all the people Sharing all the world You, you may say I'm a dreamer But I'm not the only one Thank God I hope someday you'll join us And the world will be as one Amen. So may it be speedily and in our day.